So, you know, you can see here, I just grabbed a few images. That's a house in Wales, um, stone, and I'm sure he's got beams in there, you know, doing a perfectly good job of supporting all that roof. But that's, again, um, you can see what he's got. That's, that's a fairly uh, thicker soil. I don't know what's in the soil, but I'm assuming it probably has more soil than we would put in there because he's probably got a good heavy beam structure inside there with those rock walls and everything. So doesn't mean you couldn't have a roof that looked like that with the kind of extensive design that we're talking about here. It's just a matter of, of uh, blending the soil correctly and putting a lightweight material in with it. You know, there's a lot of um, regulatory hurdles. So. Re regulatory? Code is going to be an issue if you're, if you're going to live in the, you know, if it's a residential thing, the code is definitely going to be, is going to get in the way. I mean, uh, you know, you can, um, people ignore it. Uh, I don't recommend that, especially with something like this where, you know, it, it could collapse. Um, but um, you could also <clears throat> meet the code, but you, you're going to have to get an engineer to approve your, your plans. And, you know, you could, you can, you can draw the plans up or have a draftsman draw it up. You don't have to hire an architect to do the plans, but the engineer is going to have to stamp the plans, and then, and then you take it from there. Um, and this is not rocket science. I mean, I, I have some tables in here. I mean, if you want to do it yourself, you actually could, and then um, still take it to the engineer for a stamp. But um, it's not anything uh, unusual, or it's just a heavily loaded roof. I mean, it'd be like a a warehouse or something in the old days where they had wooden beams. That's, that's really all it is. And you know, for the kind of roof we're talking about, for the kind of soil mix, it isn't all that heavy. And I'll, you'll see that as we get on. So we, you know, why do we even want to consider it? Uh, we are reducing runoff, just, just urban and suburban, or even rural runoff. Uh, in the cities, of course, it's more of a concern. Um, you're actually, it's actually serving as a sponge, and it will evaporate. So instead of just running right off the roof into the drain and down the storm sewer, it's going to not only reduce the runoff, but it's also going to improve the quality of the water that does run off. So that's a, that's a big one. That's an important thing. And again, in an urban or suburban environment, that's, that's a, a goal or one of the big uh, desires of anybody who promotes or advocates roofing, uh, living or green roofing is, is that. Um, the other thing, it's, it's a no-maintenance roof. I mean, not to say that, I mean, how many people really get up on their roofs and fix the shingles? I mean, you know, people don't really, really do that, but well, they might if they have to. But I mean, it's, um, the thing is, once it's up, there's really no, you know, short of a catastrophic, um, you know, like um, even a hailstorm, I mean, something, something like shoot through it or something, it's not going to really leak. Uh, if it's not designed properly, you may have issues around the perimeter that have to be replaced wood or something, but uh, you know, it's basically designed to be a very low maintenance or no maintenance roof. And I'm talking about the, the, the roof itself, not, e not even the plants. I mean, it's, you don't have to mess with it. You don't have to worry about a shingle blowing off or a tin roof you know, flapping and cracking or something like that, or nails coming out or screws coming out, um, or plywood lifting, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it promotes energy conservation and moderates temperature swings. Now, it is, it is actually not insulation. I, I, I have heard people say it's an insulative roof. It's, you know, it officially or um, technically it is not, it, the, the earth is not really insulation. There is, there, if you put vermiculite in it or perlite, a lightweight substance, it, it will help that, but it's not, I don't want to call it insulation because it's really not. What it does, as I said outside, it, it it helps temper the swings of extremes, of the peaks and the valleys of, of hot to cold in, in, a, in a single day. It takes a while for that cold to get through that soil. Um, it, will, uh, it will be a heat sink. Uh, the sun hits on it, it's going to absorb some of that heat. So it's not going to pass it through into the building immediately. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So it's really a, it's a, both a conservation and a moderation effect on it. Um, obviously, it has aesthetic appeal. It looks good if you can if you can see it. Now, some roofs are really not visible. I mean, they're not meant to be visible. They just they're just there to work as living roofs, and they're um, the fact that you can't see them is a shame. But you know, that's just the way it is. That's one just one little thing that's not available. But if you can see them, they look good. I mean, that's that's our roof there, right there, and it looks you can see the containers of our biochar. Uh, 
uh, byproduct back there, but you know the roof itself, you know, looks pretty pretty neat. And of course, nobody's out there to see it, but uh, that's all right. Um, definitely a wildlife and a pollinator uh, attractant. You know, it's it's always nice to have another, um, you know, another place where where the uh, where the uh, pollinators or any any kind of wildlife, a butterfly, whatever, will will be attracted to a little oasis maybe in the urban environments. And I'm going to talk, you know, I'll be referring to urban because that's really where a lot of this is happening. Um, but that's, um, you know, it's another, and you can choose your plantings to facilitate that uh, as long as they meet the requirements of what you set your soil up for. For culinary and herb production, I mean, if, if you want to make it so you can access the roof, that particular roofing on the little ladder up there, I mean, if, if we wanted to actually walk on that roof, I'd get a, I'd build a stair, yeah, like a short little stairway so you could, with, with railing so you could actually walk up and not climb the ladder. Um, we're not really doing that. We, we will have herbs up there, but not, you know, it's not like a regular production kind of thing. Um, but you can do it that way. I mean, you can, you can make it so you can access the roof and, and pick, uh, you know, harvest and, uh, and tend and all you want. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's part of the deal if, if you want to. Uh, temper the urban heat island. Uh, if you have black asphalt, um, tarmac, dark, dark roof surfaces that sometimes some of these older buildings don't have the white coating, they have the uh, black tar roof, tar covered roof. That's, that is a horrible, that solar effect is horrible in an urban environment which is already crowded and hot. You're just contributing to it more with a, with a black surface. So, um, which basically gets absorbed and just kicks out, uh, you know, a lot more heat. So the uh, the earthen and green covering on the roof is going to help temper that in a, you know, in a crowded environment. Um, it will increase the longevity of the roofing membranes. That's all. It's also part of part of the lower domains for the roof. I mean, basically, once you've covered it, you're not going to really have to get in there and uh, you know deal with anything unless there's a catastrophic event or if you haven't done it right uh, and there's a leak. Um, another good thing with this type of soil we use, it's not 100% earth and soil. It is a blend of things, which I'll talk about. Uh, so it's not as heavy. So if you really needed to, I mean, if we had to, we get up on that roof and with a couple of guys here at work, we could take shovels and get that thing down to the rubber and, you know, it really wouldn't be a couple hours to be done. Um, you know, it, we don't have to, but we could. Um, it helps reduce noise and air pollution. The, the noise part, just the absorbent, because there's, because there's plantings up there, it just helps to soak up some of the noises of an urban environment. And air pollution, obviously, can um, uh, cycle. You know, it can absorb some of the uh, uh, carbons and monoxide and some of the other stuff that's in the air that we, you know, we don't really need to be breathing. It's, it helps with that. Um, it can sequester carbon depending on your plant choices. And there are the stocky. The sedum isn't really that much of an improvement, but the, uh, the, the more stocky uh, plantings up there, um, not that we want to go to trees or anything or sh even shrubs, but, but the stocky type shorter plants will definitely um, help sequester, absorb and sequester that carbon in the, in the environment. Um, it will also help support or help with uh, fire prevention if the, if the plantings are not dry prairie grass type of plantings. And I, do, I, do re I did have prairie grass in there as a potential, but I mean, you, you, know, you can make that call yourself. I mean, if you just keep green grasses up there, like the switchgrass might dry out, something like that. But if you keep the uh, sedges, if you had a moisture environment to keep the sedges or some of the green moisture plants up there, it's going to be a lot less uh, apt to be a fire situation in a, in a fire area, like in the woods or something, you know, where you might have a uh, you know, concern about a fire. So we, um, a wooden roof, for example, you know, a shingle, a wooden shake roof or something is a, is a very risky roof to have in, in the woods because if there is a fire, it's going to, you know, it's, you know, number one to go up. Uh, something like this obviously is, is um, much less apt to. And this is just a picture. This is actually in Denmark, I think, or Germany, um, which, by the way, is where most of the research was done. Most of the startups, are, they're, they're in Europe. That railing is just an aesthetic improvement over the metal that I use, but it allows the water to seek, seep through and get into these gutters, which are then drained wherever they drain. So it just looks good, and it also lets the water drain out. Um, that guy's got a skylight. It looks like a little kitchen or something under there uh, that he's got. But that's, 
that's an example of a good slope. I mean, it's not, it's not too extreme. Um, he may not have even had to put uh, purlins in there, barriers to keep the, to keep the soil from, from going down. There is, a, there is a substrate you can buy that actually is shaped like a ripple so that it does hold the soil back. And you can, you know, the point of the roof we did was to try to buy as little as possible, try to make it either indigenous stuff or something that was very inexpensive or low tech, just, you know, so you don't have to spend a lot of money on it. Um, so we talked about extensive and intensive roofs. So the extensive roof is what we've got here. Um, no maintenance. It's really not intended to be, to be uh, walked on. I mean, we're not, we're not intentionally building paths and access up there. It's not that it can't be, but we, that's not really the intent of it. Uh, we're trying to keep the growing medium, or I'm not going to call it soil because it isn't soil. It's, it's a blended, a soil blended with other stuff. The growing medium depth is usually no more than six inches with an extensive roof. Um, ours, is, like I said, goes from four to five inches. Um, it can be as little as two. I mean, it depends on what you're putting in there. Um, the substrate is blended to be lightweight. And as I said, we can put in vermiculite or other uh, lima clays, um, uh, chipped brick. Um, people do put gravel in. It's, it's heavier. Gravel is another option, but it's not, it's not a lightweight approach. But perlite and vermiculite are two good choices um, w within reason. Um, and in, a, in an extensive roof, the plantings are tended as a whole. The whole roof is done, you know, it's like the whole surface. You don't go to, in, I mean, it's really not that you couldn't, but you, it wasn't intended to be like this individual plant gets tended and then you go over here and do this one. It was really the whole deal. Uh, I've planted seed them up there in spots, so I do, I do sort of watch where I'm walking so I don't step on it. But, um, but um, you know, we really don't have any particular anything in any one place there. Um, and with the extensive roofs, the goal is to keep the engineering, the actual engineer's involvement in it to a minimum um, within safety needs. I mean, obviously, you don't want to blow that off um, just because you are trying to avoid it. But uh, it needs to be, you know, it, it needs to be dealt with. <clears throat> but the, the weight and, and the uh, design of the roof is, is such that you really don't need to uh, have that kind of load on the roof. Intensive roofs uh, are designed generally, and this, they're sort of old school, and not that they're not, they are definitely still building intensive roofs, but the original roof gardens were um, you know, meant to be planted, harvested, walked around on, enjoyed. Um, uh, the restaurants w who use their uh, roofs for culinary reasons have that kind of roof. So basically, it's not the kind of roof that we're, that we're talking about within the scale of budget that most of us probably have. It's, um, you know, it's uh, substrate depth can be, uh, you know, 12 inches, 14 inches. I, some of them are over 40 inches. I mean, it's a very, very uh, heavy load. Um, you could you could apply lightweight substrates to the intensive roofs. No, there's no rule against it, but they but um, you know they will support regular uh, soil, um, and plantings will tend to be done in either in containers or on an individual basis. So you you know just like you do a garden raised bed or something uh, out here in the greenhouse, um, and you will have to have structural engineering. This is not something that's because of the weight uh, and the drainage issues. You it's not something that you can sort of just do yourself. It's it's a it's a hired job. So um, just to give you an example of runoff, because we talk, that's an important factor, because the, the, if the water stays up there, it's going to increase the weight substantially. So um, the, on a regular roof, uh, the runoff in inches, just in this particular example, the runoff in inches was 26 inches of water over the period of a year. And the, the percentage of total rainfall is 81. So you're, you're losing. I mean, you're only, you're only holding 20% um, to, to evaporation or just whatever sticks on the shingles in a normal roof. You put two inches of gravel on that roof, and you've, you've at least come down a little bit. You've gone down to 25. So you've uh, saved an inch and, you, and down to 77%. But you start looking at the greens, and you can see with two inches of substrate, four inches, six inches. So we went from 26 inches of runoff down to 13. And we went from 81% runoff down to 40. So it's a substantial difference. When, and most of the roofs are going to be four, you know, four to six uh, that, that you might do up here. So you know, it's, a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, it helps. What we 
we'll do is blend the, blend the uh, soil for, for a combination of light weight and um, water retention. But you also need the water. It's, it's, you need the water not only to retain, but you need the water to flow too. And it's a, it's a, it's a seemingly uncompatible request, but uh, that's, what, that's what we're trying to do. We, we want it to absorb and hold as much water as we can for the plants, but then to shed the water when, there, when it has enough. Um, and you, uh, again, want lightweight um, material for, uh, for the loading of the roof, as little as weight as possible. Um, and you have to have some kind of anchor for the plants. I mean, that's, that's important. Um, the, other, the other thing which, uh, even in our roof, um, has not occurred for a couple of reasons, but, but uh, it didn't hurt anything, obviously. But um, people think, well, I just have to get this such a little space, and I just have to get it perfect. Soil fertility actually is not a big goal. Moderate fertility is what you do want. High fertility you don't want because it actually, the high fertility actually creates situations where um, you'll get um, growth that you don't want and you'll get rooting that you do, root systems that you don't want and just a lot, of, a lot of things that you really don't want for the roof itself. Um, and so as long as you choose plants that, are, that will um, adapt themselves to a, to a moderate fertility level, you're in good shape. And that's, that's another big point, too. We don't want that roof back there goes through a lot of drought. I mean, we don't sit there. And I think I've watered it maybe twice in a year. We don't really want to have to be watering it. So if, if those plants can carry through on extremely dry situations in moderately good soil, you know, that's great. When you get high fertility soil, it almost, it almost makes the plants like they need to, to be serviced, you know, constantly. You really don't want to be spraying the you know, the hose up there all the time, uh, getting up there, and it's just a lot, of, a lot of effort that doesn't need to be done. So, you know, clay's in the soil. The, the vermiculite, as I said, the perlite, all that, it, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be 100% soil. It can be, you know, a mixture of, you know, even 50% even or 30% soil with, with some of the other stuff, just to keep the weight down. I'll, I'll give you a, a sample of, you can pass it around. Um, this is our... We sort of went over the, over the top, really just to get the herbs started. Um, that's, a, that's one soil test that was done. You can pass it around, and then I'll get it back again. But uh, um, just to show an example of the different amendments and whatever, I've got, uh, let's see, I forgot what he had actually put in there. We put uh, no, azomite and gypsum, um, phosphorus, or um, or uh, calcium carbonate with lime, obviously, and then we uh, uh, rock dust, which is you know uh, just just small, <clears throat> minute quantities of it, and they're really just to help carry some of those herbs through. Um, and I'm not sure it, it uh, did what it was supposed to do. I said we had some dormant uh, situation with them, but that's the only amendments really we added into that soil, and that's not necessary, particularly necessary for uh, you know your projects. Um, you know, we're trying to reach a goal. We had some boron we put in. Um, and since we're a biochar facility, the soil was blended with, with some manure. It's up to, up to, depending on which sample we use, because part of it's one, part of it's about 12, 13 percent, and part of it is up to, I think it's 20, almost 25 percent of, of um, a blend of, of uh, biochar, inoculated biochar, and um, manures, which we, which we just blended up and mixed in with the soil, which had a, a fairly high clay content. So, you know, basically I've got, you know, clay, manure, compost, biochar, and, and soil. And we had, we had a rich soil mixed with clay soil, about half and half. So, uh, you know, that was sort of a special blend, really just to sort of see how the herbs would do up there with that. I'm not going to change I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to go dig it up and change it, but we'll just sort of live, we'll take some tests and see what we're doing up there and uh, you know, just leave it. Um, I don't think we'll really have to amend anything. So essentially, those are all what, you know, those are the key goals for soil anyway. So that's, uh, that's what we did. Um, so here's, the, here's some choices for your um, additions. Light expand, it's called LECA, light expanded clay aggregate. That's that stuff in the, the brown stuff in the lower right. 
Um, that's purchasable in bags. Uh, I've seen it at Home Depot and garden stores and whatever. Um, and a small, it's you know very affordable if you don't have to do acres of it. So uh, um, you know you can blend that in. Um, not, no more than 10%, really. Uh, these clays and some of this other perlite and vermiculite, really no more than 10% of the total in the mix. Uh, if we can help that, uh, if you if you had a, if you had a weight issue, you could go up a little bit. But uh, essentially, the clay can can clog the filter fabric. Um, the perlite and the vermiculite can tend to break down over over a long term. So that isn't always. I mean, that's something to be expected, but it doesn't necessarily mean disaster. It just means it's going to break down. If you have a good if you have a good established shallow root system, it won't it won't be as uh, much of a problem. Pumice. Well, cr crushed brick or clay, um, more, more likely brick um, in small crushed, not really granules, but you know, more like that stuff in the, in the lower right, um, is fine because the clay tends to, it's, light, it's fairly lightweight and it tends to hold moisture. So that's exactly what you want. It's not going to hurt anything. It, um, it may, the mortar on the bricks that's left on the bricks may tend to change the pH a little bit, but it's not, you know, it's not a, big, a big deal. Um, gravel is an option. Again, that's uh, if you're sure that your roof is not having a support issue, if you're not on the th threshold of you know, being near uh, a danger point, the gravel would be good. I certainly wouldn't put uh, more than, there's some weight uh, figures I have there, um, wouldn't put more than two inches at the most, uh, and that would be for a, a six inch roof. I mean, I would, I would basically leave it just a, an inch or so at the bottom if you have to use gravel, but the, there's so many other options. Um, the biochar, again, you know, we have, we have the facility here, so we have the biochar, but that is, that's, that's this, the black stuff. Um, it's, you know, extremely light and airy. That, we blend it in, and I said that, that's an excellent, an excellent choice. Uh, whether it's inoculated or not, it's, it, it would be a good choice because it does have, main characteristic of that is that it will absorb water and retain water and also is light in weight. And it can be mixed easily, so you know that's, you know that's a, a big selling point. One of the reasons for the uh, not having you know perfectly, you know great soil is that too much organic material causes the shrinkage of the substrate over time. You know it will it will make it shrink. Now it doesn't really mean if you intend to replant or something you can always add, but um, you um, if you don't want to do that. Uh, you know, a moderate level of soil quality is really the way to go because it won't shrink then. Um, compost, peat, coir, any of that stuff should be used in moderation because you, you really don't want that shrinkage. And some of, the, some of these materials like the clay or silt um, can clog the filter fabrics that we use around the pipes or in the layers. So we don't want to do that. I mean, you know, like I said, clay, 10-15%. Um, is, is fine. You, it, it clay's a good thing, but not too much. This is not exactly what we used, but I am not a good artist, so I couldn't draw exactly what we had, but I can explain it, and I can use this. So you have your plantings, obviously. You have your um, medium or substrate material, your growing medium. In this particular case, and, and many people will do this, uh, you have filter cloth, so the soil and the growing medium won't get, won't get through in fine particulates and clog up. You do not want the drainage layer being clogged up with, with sediment. So you're trying to protect the drainage layer and let it do its draining job. So you cover the top with a filter cloth. I'm going to pass, well, I'll pass all this around so you can see. The soft, felty stuff is your filter cloth. It can either be woven or non-woven and punched with needles. The non-woven stuff's a little more, a little, uh, not as soft. That's your EPDM rubber. It's a solid sheet. And this is one section. This comes in big rolls, so this is just a piece. It's actually stretched out a little more. But that's the drainage layer that is the cheapest you could get. I, uh, you know, we, with the amount of biochar we used in there, uh, that works. We have actually two layers of that top and bottom of that green stuff. Um, as an alternative to that, there's what they call anchor drain, or, or, the, or the generic name is uh, wall drain, or um, there's, it's usually just structural drain. It's, a, it's much more of a, of a uh, 
woven or coiled uh, fabric or sheet, really. It's a flexible sheet that uh, isn't, I guess you can call it fabric, but it's not thin. It's usually about, about that thick, might be half an inch or so. And what it does is they, it was designed to be put up against a sealed basement wall so when the water hits, comes through the soil and hits that wall, it doesn't hit the wall first. It hits the drain mat first, and it, and it drops. And then French drains carry the water away down at the bottom. So, so that drain, in its normal use, is used to just let the water pass through it. Same here. We use it horizontally. It just, it just gets in there and just goes and spreads out. So um, essentially, that's, you know, that's what we've done. Um, a root barrier and the waterproof membrane. That stuff, that EPDM, is very tough. Um, it does not need, in most situations, it does not need a root barrier because it, it won't be invaded by the roots of the plant. If you have bitumen, tar paper, um, any kind of organic-based sheet that is a good waterproofer, you will need to use a root barrier because the roots will seek out and infiltrate any organic sheet that is um, not EPDM rubber. So... Uh, you know, it just, it's just a block, so the roots, the roots can't get into the organic material. So again, it's, it's stuff like um, tar paper, bitumen paper. Um, there's other, other, other sheets of stuff that would be used like in roofing situation or, or in certain situations. Uh, I even, I'm not even quite sure. I've never done it. Uh, just plastic. A lot of people just put six mil pl black plastic down as their, as their uh, waterproof membrane. Okay, if it's not, if the stuff under there isn't that important. That's, that's about what I'll say about that. I mean, you can't trust that, um, that thin six mil to last forever or not to be invaded by you know, something, a bug or something, get in there and, and put a hole in it or a root might come into it or whatever. That's why that, that thick rubber is just really pretty impervious. It's not going to get you know, a hole in it. However, I will, having said that, I'll say this. A friend of mine who has been building earth-sheltered houses and has been involved with earth and living roofs for you know, well over 30 years, had put one on his, um, on his house, laid the rubber out, and uh, glued everything. There's a, two, uh, there's a overlap of whatever you want to do, but you know, minimum six inches, a special kind of glue that they give you, all this stuff. So the seal is fine. Apparently, somebody had spilled a can of Coke or Mountain Dew while they were working on the roof, spilled the can over. You know, So what? It's going to get covered anyway. Threw the can off. Didn't really clean it up. Just left it there. They put on their stuff, soil and everything. Everything's great till 10, 12 years later, there's a leak in the roof. And we're trying to figure out what is going on. Well, they finally had to, um, they couldn't, you know, they dug around the edges, they couldn't find anything. Finally, I had to strip a good part of the roof off. You know, they started over the hole, over the leak, of course, and that's not where it was. It turns out that a little distance from that leak, that Sugar had attracted an ant colony. The ants came in, ate up all the sugar that, you know, they came in right under the soil and, and crawled along and ate up all the sugar that was available to them. Over, it was still there after all those years. Decided, well, well, where it must have come up from the bottom. So they dug, they used their whatever they have, it pinched and dug and chewed through that rubber. Eventually, got through it and caused a hole, and it just hit the plywood and went the plywood decking and traveled because the plywood probably had a little bit of a bow to it. And when it got to the low point, that's where the leak was. And they had to take all that soil off and check everything because they didn't know how far the ants were and everything. And they cleaned it up and patched it and everything was all right. But that's a lot of work for spilling a can of soda. Um, so nothing is, you know, nothing is perfect. OK, well, there's a better example. Um, that is actually the anchor, the anchor drain there. You know, it's more of a formal, thicker, harder coil, and it doesn't collapse. I mean, it, uh, it, it's pretty substantial. So um, you know, if you want to pay the money for it, I, I actually, the Anka factory is right in, believe it or not, Anka. Uh, you know, they, the, they have an office up there. They, apparently, they had to, if I wanted to get some, I think they said they had to send to California and put the order in there and ship it from California. So I, I didn't do that. We ended up settling for the landscape uh, um, turf mat is what we ended up using, that green stuff. But what I did was we put 
the way we did it, because of the, because of the structure of that metal roof and just because of the availability of the biochar and I, that I didn't want to spend uh, you know, any more money than we had to, there's a, the basic layer of, of EPDM rubber comes up the side, up the sides and a little extra for, for flappy in case I wanted to put a higher wall. Um, then a layer of about a, about a three quarter inch layer of biochar right on top of that. And biochar is, I'm sorry, I should have brought it in, but it, it will, I'll show it to you. It's just like chunks of about the size of like pea gravel, the smaller, the smaller gravel, uh, much lighter. Uh, shovel that on there, spread it out just right, you know, even and all, and then put a layer of the, um, of the drain, uh, uh, the, uh, the green drain, and then we had a layer of the, of the uh, uh, filter mat, uh, and then uh, put, I'm uh, sorry, put the, 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 put the, another layer of, of biochar on top of that, and then the filter mat. And then um, we put the soil, but, but the, I have a picture of it there, the uh, drain tubes I also wrapped in filter mats so that if, if anything got to, any sediment or whatever got to those drains, which are just tubes, PVC tubes, two inch PVC tubes with, with a lot of quarter inch holes drilled through them all throughout the, the whole length of the tube all around. So it just, water hits it and just goes, they're sloped slightly to go down. Um, a little less. They're actually normal slope is, is about a quarter inch to the foot, but it's nowhere near that steep. It's it, I kept a little less because it still moves out, um, and it's also the function of the roof. I mean, sort of the there's a hump on top of that roof. The roof actually, you know, is sort of humpy, so it so it does have to um, ride the whatever's up there. Have to sort of just whatever we got. So that's uh, basically what we what we did. So I wrapped that so we didn't have any sediment getting in. Uh, and then came the soil or the, or the medium on top of that. So, um, you know, we have several layers of biochar and, and uh, turf mat to deal with to help filter everything out before it, before it drains. What happens in, in um, essence with that roof because of the, the hump shape, the drain, without putting drains on that side, which I didn't want to do, so that back part facing south, which is actually a good thing because it's hotter, uh, has a little more moisture. The water does sit in there at the bottom, just a little bit at the bottom, uh, longer than the rest of the building, which, which gets drained quicker. So we have sort of almost like two, we have a wet zone and a, and a dry zone almost. Uh, actually, a wet, a moderate, and a dry zone, uh, just in that little space up there. Um, but essentially, all that water, almost all of it, gets out. And, um, and anything in the front there uh, if we have to, we'll go back and put in plants that are more water tolerant, more moisture tolerant up there. But I don't see any real problem. But you know, if, if it happens, we'll know. We'll know that that front part is is a little wetter. This is a better picture. Is Dan putting the uh, just using the shovel? See, so you can see the tubes. The green is on the bottom, and then there's a layer. Uh, uh, there's biochar on there, and then um, uh, we've got the, the wraps of, of uh, filter fabric around the three. There's only three drains. You've got the back drain and the three drains. And you can see they all, I think you maybe see the angle. It is going down. So what's wet, what's going to stay wetter is that part up there. So, and that's, like I said, one way of doing it. I mean, that's, that's the way we did it because that's our, that was our situation with, with the steel roof the way it was and the materials that we chose to, to use on it. Um, we've already seen that. I mean, it's basically just the uh, close-up of the two-inch bulkhead, the two-inch short two-inch pipe, and then the transition two to three-inch, and then the three-inch pipe out. Now, if you know, in another situation, you could they could just go out to a a gutter, you know, just drain, uh, just terminate, or or you could even put a little elbow at the bottom. But they would um, go into a gutter, and then the water would be gone. And this is what looks from the top view. Uh, it goes into the existing gutter, just rests on these cradles that we made. Um, and you know, out we go, and it goes off. And since there's no, it's an organic situation, there's no chemicals in there. There's nothing in there that's going to be an issue. So it goes right into, the, right into the pond. This is the Chinese herb we were talking about. It's just the beginning of a useful part of that roof. It's not just a prairie up there or a meadow. It's, 
we're going to try to plant some herbs. This particular one was we were cultivating in the other greenhouse that are on our Kimsey farm. Mm -hmm. So essentially, this, this herb, it's, a, it's an Asian herb. It's beneficial for heart health. It's supposed to keep cholesterol down. Um, it's supposed to help with environmental stress. And um, apparently, it's supposed to, but I, I, haven't, I have not been able to find any real evidence. But apparently, it's supposed to contr help control blood pressure. But it does make a good tea. And it is a little unusual. So we, you know, we had some uh, director had asked me to put some up front here. And, and just see how it does. And that was, that was part of the deal. And you can see this was just initially planting some rye up here. Um, basically, some, uh, put some uh, straw down and, uh, and planted some rye just to stabilize. And then put in the, uh, the herb, the Chinese herb up here. And I have a feeling that it's probably a little too wet for it where it is. But we'll, you know, we'll see. OK, so structurally, um, this, this is important stuff. I just, I'll go through it pretty quick because you, you have it here. But it's, uh, we, have a, we have a different load. Our codes call for much different load levels than, say, Canada, where they have a lot of snow. And it changes. Like Mi Miami is zero. And it goes up to um, a fairly high load level, as, say, in Toronto or, or north. Um, so in the, in the resources I've, I've Giving you access to a um, to the North Carolina Residential Building Code, and even though it's you have to wade through that thing, you eventually will find it's searchable. So you will you can find online various things about load levels and where your zone is and all that kind of stuff. But um, um, deck loads, I'm going to talk about live loads and dead loads. I'll define them later. But uh, deck loads have decks have a live load standard. In other words, people and barbecue grills and anything else you put on a deck. Not the, not the building materials itself, but the, the, the movable stuff that you're going to be moving onto that deck has 60 pounds a square foot. A uh, bedroom, for example, is about 30 or 40, depending on the use of the room. So 60 is you know, pretty decent. So when you're talking about putting soil up there, you've got to think about, you know, I'm going to be a person up there. I'm going to have this much soil up there. And you can add up all your materials. And your, if you're going to be up there or have people up there, then you have to think about that, too. But that's basically a number, a good place to start. So you need to be building that um, surface up there to support, you know, at least that's a good number, um, 60. So, um, you know, I just picked that because that's what a deck is, and that's, you know, it's easily findable in, in structural text to look to see how many, what the joist spacing is, what kind of wood you need, and uh, how, how thick, how a deep a 2 by 8 or a 2 by 10 or a 2 by 12 uh, to support that. Um, slope roofs only have about 20 pounds per square foot. So that's, that's an issue. And if you, have, if you have an existing slope roof, you really need to, you will probably have to bolster that somehow to keep that weight in check because they don't have, you know, they just don't have the support. They're not meant to have the support other than snow. Uh, you know, 20 pounds is not all that much. Extensive systems, which is what we've got out here, uh, will increase the normal load of of that surface by 14 to 35 pounds a foot, depending on the materials, not only the depth, but the materials you choose to put in there. So if you have a roof that will only support, say, 30, and you're putting 35 on there, that's not going to work. If you have a roof that um, supports 40, and you're putting 35 on it, I wouldn't recommend that. Even though it's under the limit, it's pretty close. I would go with a lower, a less deep substrate thickness, You know, go from 6 down to 4. Or I would start thinking about building in some lighter weight uh, blend to uh, help with that. In, intensive roofs, which are the fully engineered roofs, they, they, they can hold up, you know, up to 200. So obviously, there's no problem with that. That's why they're engineered. On a moderately sloped roof, you, you might want to think about containers as opposed to straight soil, because it'll be lighter in a, in a way if you keep the containers shallow. And you can intersperse with other stuff, so you don't have to have a growing medium on every square inch of that surface. You can, you can put lighter weight stuff between the containers in a grid pattern so that you can um, have your plants but have the lightweight as well. A typical container, however, is going to be probably six to eight inches, you know, if you get a nice old bucket. That you don't really want that. You want to try to keep that down and choose your plantings down so you don't need as much. Although if you had a number of those but not t entirely covered the roof with them, you'd, you'd be OK. So it's really a matter of planning. I mean, you've got to think about, unfortunately, numbers. And, um, and you know, the information is all available either from the sheets themselves that I'm handing out or the references in the sheets. 
you know, all the numbers are, are there. Um, shouldn't be, you know, that difficult. Um, dead loads are just the construction materials, uh, you know, the, um, the rafters, the nails, the shingles, if it was a roof, the um, uh, plywood decking, the um, any joist hangers. Uh, and in the whole building, it would include walls and all that stuff. But we're just talking about the roof. So, so basically, it's the building materials is your dead load. And live loads, I already explained, they're, they're, um, they're going to be the people on the roof, the soil on the roof, anything you add to the roof on a deck. I said that would be a barbecue grill or people or, or a stove or whatever else you might want to put up there. So that is that. But they don't include environmental loads, which are going to be rain loads, snow loads, and anything else that you know, has to do with the environment. So you do not want a ton of water coming on there, as I said several times, and then not being able to drain off. Because you're going you're gonna to double. Uh, I'm just saying double. It could, be, it could be one and a half. It could be more than double. But you're going to increase the weight of that, build, of that load considerably if the water's not drained off. And the same thing with snow. I mean, snow loads here. Uh, you know, that's a five, in, you know, in moderate areas, it's five, you know, five pounds a square foot, which is nothing. Um, up in Canada, they have, their codes require 80, uh, 80 pounds a square foot because it doesn't always melt. You know, up there, I mean, here it might snow and be pretty deep, and then, and then it will melt in two days or one day. Up there, it's, uh, once it snows, a lot of time. I've been there many, many times and work up there. Some, in some communities up there, it, it starts snowing in October, and it doesn't come away till April. Um, and so you have to think about that. Now, Wet snow is obviously heavier than dry snow. But all this kind of thing, you just have to think about environmental loads to get that water off there. Think about any snow that might be up there, and that has to melt. So you might want to think about a southern exposure for, for that kind of thing. Um, or you might have to just build the structure to, to support. You know, We don't get anywhere near 80 pounds, but I mean to support you know, a load of, of snow that might be 12 inches or something that we get. There's a weight of material, so you can figure out what you're putting up there. One inch, this is, not, this is pounds per square foot, but it's one inch layer. <clears throat> so the biochar is fairly light, you can see that. The uh, brick is heavier, so you're not using a whole lot of crushed brick, but you, know, you, you would, might want to use crushed rubble brick or, or granules of brick. Uh, pumice is even lighter than, um, than um, the biochar. Gravel is probably the heaviest up there, well, soil and gravel are the heaviest. Um, if, you, if you do use gravel, I would use you know, less than an inch or, or just enough to get, let the water out. Um, soil, obviously, you have to have some soil, but that's, that's going to be your heaviest element. Perlite and the vermiculite are both lightweight. The vermiculite is quite a bit lighter. Again, they, uh, they can be blended in. There's this little, pe you, you know, probably everybody's seen it. They're little pebbly, little lightweight, fluffy white things uh, you can buy in bags at the garden store. As I said, they will break down over, over a long term, but uh, still, it's still a, a good thought. Uh, the clay granules, you can get them at the, at the grower's um, supply, or, or uh, I think even Home Depot has them. Um, they're good. Uh, they can replace your brick, or you can blend them with some brick, and some brick being bigger maybe, bigger chunks, and the, and the granules are, are small little pebble, uh, size of uh, BBs maybe, something like that, a little bigger. And water is too... For every inch of water, you're talking a little over a, over a pound a square foot. So that's a lot of weight. So you want to get that off. Yeah. I have a question. Um, the gravel is most likely, I mean, more for runoff, right? More to. That's really just to, yeah, it's really just to, just to leave spaces between. That's what you put on the very lowest level. And to, you don't mix it in with the, you don't necessarily have to mix it in with the soil. You want to keep it as a layer. And that is basically to allow porous. Uh, channels through the layer so the water can move. So if you have the drainage filter already, would uh -huh. it be necessary to use the gravel as well, or would you use them, like, would you replace the uh, drainage filter with the gravel or vice versa? If you had a substantial drainage layer, you wouldn't need to use the gravel. Um, I wouldn't call the green stuff we used all that substantial, but the only reason it works for us is because uh, it's a turf mat. It works for us is because the biochar is also a drainage. We had two layers of that as a drainage uh, medium as well. So th that does work, and it's, it's lightweight. I would look into, into pricing out a little more substantial mat than that, than that turf mat that we use, although you could, you could layer it, and it would be fine. It's just that uh, if there's too much weight on it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to eventually crush it down. It's not going to be as effective.
So uh, it's worth it to spend a little extra and get um, uh, a generic uh, drain mat. I, I know you can't read this, but I wanted to put it in there. These are the span tables that just let you see. Uh, I'll just tell you what's up here. This is design, these are, are structured by engineers. When it gets out into the real world, um, nobody pays attention to it, I, I think. I mean, it's a, har a harsh way to put it, but this is like a prime piece of lumber. That's the next grade, number one, number two, number three. So but you, what you're going to get in the store, basically, is probably going to be somewhere in the number two range, so you can use that. This is only southern pine, which is what we use mostly in construction in this area. I mean, there are houses with oak, and there's older houses with oak or other woods, hemlock or whatever. Um, but I'm just, it's just, there it is in the chart. Um, the reference table in the back of the handout has the full reference for all this here. But this lets you know that how, how at what length between, on a, on a support, between say, let's say that was the support there, that from there to there. So how far, can that be eight feet, 11 feet, 12 feet, 10, point, 10 foot, six inches? That's what this is telling you, uh, a two by six, a two by eight, a two by 10, or a two by 12. So you're g given um, for 100 pounds per square inch of live load, a uh, two by 10 of number two grade um, is going to uh, be spaced at 16 feet. So that's, that gives you the idea of, so you have all these different parameters you have to pick, and how long can you allow, can you make that beam before it be uh, begins to get unsafe? And that's essentially what it is. It's not, as I said, it's not rocket science, but it does have to be paid attention to. If you, if you had the time to read through the reference for that and the reference for the North Carolina Residential Code, which actually has a really good glossary in it, the code is 700, 836 pages, whatever, um, but it is searchable. So you could go through. If you spend the time reading it, it does have pretty good explanations as to why, not so much why they do it, but what is required. Um, and sometimes they will even tell you why. Unlike the inspector, when they come to look at your house, they won't tell you why. They just say yes or no, or fix it. You know. So the residential building code and there's some other books that I put in there that are actually are really good references. Uh, you asked about roof slopes. That is how you handle that. 9.5 degrees um, practical roof slope. There have been I've, I've seen pictures like that one. It's definitely not a two and twelve. Uh, the, the pitch, the slope is 2 and 12 means uh, it's just the ratio of the rise to the, to the length of the, so you're looking at, at a, a flat roof, um, you know, 5 degrees, 9.5 degrees is 212, you know, as we go up, 45 degrees is 6, somewhere in the 612, and of course we don't have a roof like that, but some roofs can be pretty steep. So essentially we're talking about a, a sort of a fairly shallow roof, uh, less, than, less than that, is about the maximum practical slope you can have before you start having to use some kind of stabilization in there like these grids or even just lateral stabilizers. So you just don't want the soil to, to fall down to the bottom. It hits that and stops, you know, and then hits the next one and stops. So that's, you know, essentially that is some work. I mean, that's really, that's really redesigning your roof surface. Um, if you were building a shed, a chicken coop, whatever, very, very simple. It's not that hard. If you were retrofitting an existing roof, it gets a little more complicated. So um, when you start, yeah? Is there a maximum uh, practical roof slope? Well, maximum practical? With the, with the stabilizers? What? With the stabilizer. Yeah, I mean, I've seen them about 45 degrees. I don't think anything more than that. I'm not saying that there never has been one built like that, but I don't, I don't think um, it wouldn't be common to see one more than 45 degrees, which would be about a six or seven. It's in that range, six, or six and a half uh, to 12 uh, slope. They do make, when I say they, it's architecturally designed, um, like eco homes, whatever. They do ma actually make plastic or um, formed ABS gutter-like things that you can actually sit up there that actually hold. I mean, they're sort of they're sort of cupped so that they will hold soil. I mean, you can get that, but they're beyond the scope of our budgets really for most people. So you know, I would I would this is fine and. You don't really need to go that steep. I mean, unless you have a, already have a roof and you have to work with that. Then, if if that was the case, I would definitely research. You you can find um, information on that. Uh, Usually, the purpose of a steep slope is so that the snow will slide off. Well, you want to get rid of the water and the snow. Yeah, I mean, it also it's also aesthetic. I mean, they really look. I mean, they started out being um, for 
practical purposes, but when you look at a modern house, you know, uh, many modular home people wish they would, if only my roof was really steep, it would make it look a lot better, you know. But, you know, it, it is prettier. Of course, it costs more for um, roofing work. I mean, if you have shingles, whatever, I mean, it's, it's always the guy takes a look. If it's a fairly shallow or flatter roof, it's cheaper. I mean, just, it's a lot of risk getting up on that, a lot of work. Here's just an example of uh, another exa uh, way this guy's handled sort of a quasi cordwood style uh, shed. I guess it's a garden shed or even maybe a wood shed. I don't know. But the walls are cordwood masonry style. Um, I don't see any mortar in there, so I don't think it's really cordwood masonry. But, uh, but he's, got his, uh, he's got his fairly steep, steep roof, and I don't see anything in there. He may have some short um, parallel bolsters in there at the bottom, but I don't see them. So that's a, that's a you know example. That's just you know that's the kind of thing that probably we could all do. I mean that's, that is not that difficult. There's no real risk involved with, with that. I mean you're not going to be living under that thing, um, and you're draining. You know he's draining the water somehow. I assume through through that behind that or something, um, or maybe just out the front. I, don't, I really don't know. You know you don't have to have a gutter by the way. Gutters are really just to keep the foundation dry. I mean you, if you had a a runnel or a swale on the ground with gravel and slope just away, it would do the exact same thing. Um, you know, the gutter does not have to be on the roof. It can be on the, on the ground, too. Uh, the only reason it's there is to keep the water from getting back in the foundation. Yeah. Um, so one thought that I'm having is that um, on the drainage on the one here, you have it coming off the side. And therefore, there's going to be some water collection underneath the pipe that it won't be able to, it won't necessarily drain completely. And, um, and so, like, if you were to have, like, a, over, like a overhang, mm -hmm. then you could potentially get the drain at the bottom, you know, coming out of the bottom as opposed to the end or right there at the... Yeah. The, is there disadvantages other than, I guess, weight um, of the water sitting um, for, for the most part, most of the drain? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, it can sit in a, it can sit in a gutter or a container or a holder, you know, anything that's not soil, that's, that's, there's no reason for that to be a problem, um, if it's, as long as it's not going to rot, you know, it's, it's plastic or aluminum or something. Um, the only problem with the, other than the weight, would be just that it'll kill anything. I mean, you can not, uh, I wouldn't say anything, but anything that's not intended to be in a, in a, in a marshy situation isn't going to make it. The other thing is, if it puddles and collects, you're going to have a mosquito problem. We don't want that either. So, you know, that's, that's, that's a real, that's a very real thing. So, um, you can pretty much get around any of that physical stuff, uh, even, if it even if it amounted to building a little mini drain system separately for that area, just to get you know get rid of it. Anyway, that's, that is a is a I have it's probably some kind of sod or something. I don't know what, but I noticed it and I thought that's if anybody has a question on slope roofs. I think it's bermed in the back. I think it's actually a bermed building, so the back of it it looks like has a back here. Actually, has earth coming up to that's a retaining wall, and there's earth actually all around the back, so it makes a lot of sense to have, you know, a lot of this green roof and uh, and earthen roof stuff was was all part of the movement towards earth sheltered buildings, you know, in the 1970s, and uh, just carried beyond that. These are basically what's up up there. Uh, well, not everything because the sedges. We don't have any sedges. Prairie grass. Again, that's a, it could be a fire issue if you're worried about that. So, you know, unless you keep it moist or you know watered frequently, um, ground covers are fine. I mean, the native, you know, we're getting a lot of questions um, about native and non-native, and I we usually tend towards native plantings, but there are good arguments for non-natives in certain. You know, if you have a specific need, all I did was talk to a few people here and co coworkers about what might be good up there, and then I went to a nursery, with several good nurseries in the area, but I went to one in Weaverville where she basically just advised me for what I knew we would have is a, a lot of drought conditions here um, through some of the seasons, and, but yet it would be tolerant to cold and be tolerant to um, you know, heavy rains as long as it was drained out. So the ones we picked were the, um, th these two sedums, uh, which are doing pretty well up there. And then I just started putting in, I got some red clover and put it in myself. And some of this other stuff was really just in the, uh, the grasses. I used a rye um, like that and some other, uh, other rye, an annual actually up, up in the beginning. And then uh, the prairie grasses, I don't really have anything up there. But if you could do that, you could order it in from Wisconsin or whatever if you had some 
selections you wanted. Some of it will do very well in that, in that, especially in a drier climate. Like I said, some of these other things were volunteers like that, that, uh, the asters all came up. Ground covers, you know, if there's something you particularly like in ground cover, you know, it's really, as long as it will tolerate, you know, that dry season, if you don't intend to water it, it's fine. One of the things I, I need to tell you, which is sort of important, if you have a situation, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't have to stick with the drought tolerant plants. If you want to keep your environment wetter, whether that means drip irrigation or watering it or just not draining it as well, as long as it's not sitting in a puddle, you can go towards the um, more um, moist, moisture tolerant plants. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I've seen, there were some images, I just was looking for other images. There were, things, there were marsh plants or cattail. I mean, there were all sorts of stuff growing on people's roofs, but not in our situation. I just didn't, you know, didn't, that wasn't appropriate for what, what I was trying to accomplish there. Um, but there are some definitely forest tolerant plants that would, work, would do very well up on the roof as long as it, it wasn't getting uh, direct sunlight. Like uh, some people have asked me already what I don't get much sunlight. I get a little morning sun and the rest of it's uh, shade. Well, then you, you, you need more moisture up there and you need to just choose plantings that are forest plantings, not, not prairie plantings. You have to plant around that. It's no different than you know, out, out here in the world. That first book is it's a hardcover book and it was pretty expensive new, but you can probably find it. It's uh, 2005 or six, but it's still very, very applicable, a great book. Uh, residential building code, and the rest of it's, you know, just other, either with plantings or with uh, structural stuff. You know, I'm not going to go through all of them because there's really nothing particular. But there's some, I just have a couple of pictures, and that's a good example of a slope roof in a boathouse. Uh, that's in Germany, I think. As I said, U Europe is way ahead of us in, in having existing buildings already up, and they just do a lot of research, a lot of uh, meteorological research, too, a lot of climatology, a lot of things like how does the effect of evaporation off this roof affect the city of Stockholm or whatever, you know, and they'll, and they'll actually do some quantitative, you know, measurements in addition to making it look good. Uh, that's actually in Norfolk, Virginia. And, you know, they handled that very nicely. You got a wooden, I think it looks like wood around the outside here, uh, just here with a gutter below it and obviously some kind of scupper or drain system there. But that's a, that's a substantial it's about a 45 degree slope on there and they're, they're doing it. And I don't, I don't think they get up there and tend that. I mean, that, that's pretty much, you know, they might if they have to, but it's not a regular thing. So that wraps up that. Is any particular questions, specific or otherwise? Again, I would, I would recommend if you're in a situation where you're unsure about the strength and stability, this is the most important thing, try to get an engineer involved. For something simple like this, it, it wouldn't be that expensive because it's, it's so accessible. I mean, you may not be familiar with all the books and all the charts and everything, but he'd know probably off the top of his head what, you know, that a 2 by 12 is going to support. It's going to take 16 feet for 100 pounds, that kind of thing. And the code. I mean, if, you, if you're in a place where you're uh, concerned about code compliance or whatever, especially new building, I wouldn't invest in a new building without, and, and put the roof on without going through the code compliance with it, because you're going to have to anyway for the, for the uh, stamp. Uh, they're not going to give you a permit without the stamped uh, plans. Um, and again, I think the other important thing is that the don't stick with, if, if you want, if you don't want dry prairie-like roof, keep the soil moist, more moist and just go with something more tolerant of moisture. That's as long as it's drained. You know, so that, that means if you have to put in a, a subsoil drip irrigation system, if that's what you want, go for it. If you want to put in a time sprinkler system, um, or whatever aerial water and it's on a timer, go for it. I mean, I, I said I have gone up there with the hose or even just from the, not even gone up there. I've just aimed the hose and let it spray on there briefly a couple times, but I don't think I had to. I just felt like I didn't want, I didn't want to risk the, you know, wholesale demise of that roof in the first year. So, you know, that's it. So we'll call it a day and, you know, good luck to you on your, on your living roofs. All right, yeah, very good. Thank you.